Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. Um, and this is um, protecting our kupuna from the coronavirus here on Community Matters. And we have Brad Wilcox, who's an MD, who runs research and uh, the department on uh, kupuna, kupuna healthcare, I guess, in Japsom, and is also involved in Kuwakini. Uh, so uh, welcome to the show, Brad. It's uh, very nice to have you on. Pleasure to be here, Jay. Thank you for for inviting me. Can you can you uh, help me with the details of your uh, of your affiliations on in uh, uh, in Jabsom and Kuwakini? Sure, I'm a, a prof full professor and director of research at the Department of Geriatric Medicine at the John A. Burns School of Medicine at the University of Hawaii. I've been in part of the department for almost two decades now. Um, and my other role is I, uh, I'm director of, the, of an NIH uh, Center for Biomedical Research Excellence on Aging. So we're, it's basically a, a very large grant to build aging infrastructure in Hawaii so that we can understand aging better and find ways to help uh, mitigate the, the uh, costs, if you will, the health costs of aging in terms of uh, chronic diseases and other problems. Yeah, very important, you know, with the, you know, the, uh, the curve going to elder, you know, more elderly people in our community, especially in Hawaii. But um, here we have something special. I mean, I, I know you've been faced with, uh, with viruses before in those 20 years, uh, but certainly this is, this is worse, isn't it, than what you've seen before? Yes, it, this is uh, uh, a pandemic. It's, it's worldwide and it's uh, probably the closest thing uh, we've seen to this is the, uh, well, I haven't seen it because I wasn't born at that time. I don't think you were either, Jay, but the 1918 to 1919 influenza pandemic in terms of uh, its ability to spread across the world um, and its ability and its lethality. I mean, this, the coronavirus isn't as lethal as that influenza virus, but by sheer numbers, there's a lot more people around than there were in uh, 1919. And there's uh, people are a lot more connected in terms of traveling all over the world. So it has the ability to spread uh, just, as, just as bad. Yeah, and that's, that's a fantastic. This is gonna be something that, you know, people will remember for the rest of their lives. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, and the story will be told by the survivors. Um, well, you know, yes. it, 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 the more you learn about the coronavirus, the more you stand in awe of it. Because uh, like, like other viruses, but maybe worse, uh, you can go through the whole disease and uh, never even know it. It can be very mild. You, you don't even take note of it. And yet you're spreading the virus everywhere, every day, and everyone around you. That's deadly. Um, secondly, um, it doesn't yeah. take much virus, many viral particles to infect someone else. Uh, arguably only one, only one uh, virion, V-I-R-I-O-N, uh, will be enough to infect someone else. Um, so, you know, the whole thing is so, so dangerous in a, a community setting. And then, and then uh, you find that uh, the kupuna are the most vulnerable of all. Um, and this is of great concern to anybody who is a kupuna, or somebody like yourself who is trying to take care of them. And so I wanted to talk to you today about, you know, what things we can do to protect them in the face of this, this lethal disease, which is effectively all around us. Um, so what is your, you know, standard way of protecting them? What is your advice to them? What kind of infrastructure do you like to put around them? Uh, how are you handling this? Um, first of all, Jay, I entirely agree with your assessment of this, this uh, really uh, dangerous situation for Kapuna as well as others that uh, can and will get infected. And the fact that mo the majority of the transmission is probably through asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic vectors, especially children, um, that's, that's a problem. Um, this virus, uh, it's an RNA virus. So it doesn't have any DNA. So technically you could say it's not alive, but it's covered by this lipid layer. And if, and it needs your own cells to become alive, it's kind of 
if you will, it's like a zombie virus, you know, <laughs> a zombie, you don't know if they're dead or alive, but they, they eat <laughs> things and they run around causing trouble. <laughs> so that's what happens with coronavirus. And once, once they hijack your cells, like you said, like a very small amount is all that's needed. And it may well be, uh, there's evidence suggesting now that it may well be uh, airborne, maybe not as bad as as uh, something like tuberculosis, but certainly something to worry about and, and something to use extra precaution with. Um, so uh, getting back to your question, Jay, I mean, the I think one of the uh, kind of uh, the most straightforward messages comes from the World Health Organization, where they basically say, stay home, uh, save lives. And so basically staying at home as much as you can keeping a safe distance from others. Uh, generally, we recommend about six feet. Uh, wash your hands often. Uh, the virus cannot survive soap because the soap breaks down the lipid layers uh, of the virus and then the di virus dies. So you have to you know, do a thorough job, at least 20 seconds of soap in your hands um, and you know, putting the soap in between your fingers and get it, get it as kind of uh, as a foamy as possible. And those, those little foam bubbles basically are virus killers. Um, and of course, uh, cover your cough if you have one, you know, cough into your, into your elbow like this so you don't spread it around. Um, and if you're sick, uh, definitely call ahead. Call your physician, uh, call the emergency room if, if, you're, if you're having breathing problems. Um, and uh, listen to that advice. Uh, don't just hop in a car and go somewhere. Yeah. So what's the, uh, you know, what's the level of, of uh, s symptoms that should make a kupuna concerned? I mean, we've heard, you know, uh, that if you have shortness of breath, um, if you have a, a cough, if you, if you have a runny, I guess a runny nose, if you have fever, that's a big one. Anything over, uh, what is it? A, a, a 101, 100.4, I think something like that. Yeah, one hundred point four Fahrenheit. These, these, are, the, these are the these are the telltale signs. So suppose you only have one yes. or possibly two of these. What, what do you do? When do you start getting concerned? There's actually um, there's a really good um, how shall I say it? It's a it's kind of like a calculator where um, it's on the CDC website, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and it gives you uh, basically guidance on when and how to seek medical attention, you know, with things like trouble breathing, uh, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, um, confusion or in inability to arouse, um, bluish lips or face. Those are emergency signs that you need to get to the emergency room right away. Um, and so if you, if you actually go to the CDC website, which is easy to find through, uh, through any, any uh, basically um, search engine such as Google, just type in CDC uh, and uh, coronavirus, um, and then you'll see uh, uh, this self checker for decision making. It's, it's actually cdc.gov forward slash coronavirus, and then it'll guide you to this. Um, but certainly, you know, those are the, 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 the emergency uh, signs where you should really seek help. Um, if you only have a couple of the signs, um, it's still worth, you know, calling your physician to seek guidance. And because uh, this t can really turn rapidly. Often what happens is you have a small fever, which barely qualifies like 100.4. And then you start to get a little bit better. And then uh, a few days later, all of a sudden you're at 103 degrees and you're, you're burning up and you're just having You've got a cough, and and it, and you're really uh, you're really going you know south at that point, and you really need to seek medical attention. Mm -hmm. So you say you call you call your uh, primary uh, physician. Um, you wouldn't. You, well, I've heard it both ways. So you wouldn't just call nine one one and tell them to take you away. Um, no, you would call. The, Sorry, that's a good that. point. I mean, yes, yes. If you're if, if you have any of those symptoms like you, uh, uh, new confusion or inability to arouse, you know, bluish lips or face, uh, trouble breathing, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, you call 911. Yes, absolutely right. If you have more minor symptoms, 
you know, just a mild fever and you're just starting to get a little bit of cough and then you can seek uh, advice from your, your physician. Okay, so now you call 911 and they send an ambulance for you. Um, mm -hmm. Where can the ambulance take you? What are you going to find? Who is going to do the triage on you? And what, what are they going to do? I, I'm, I guess, you know, it's, it's a morbid thought, but uh, I, I think mm -hmm. people would like to know what, what the experience is like and what they're going to find uh, at the end of that 911 call. Well, what will happen is the ambulance will show up and they'll make a, an assessment based on your vital signs. Um, and if they, if they decide, uh, the, the ambulance crew decides that you are really in serious trouble, then, uh, then you will be triaged immediately into uh, the emergency room. If you, if you have just mild symptoms and you're stable, uh, there, if you go to various hospitals, they have different ways of triaging you, but you will be triaged, uh, uh, into the appropriate, uh, location. Uh, and if, if you need admitting to the hospital, they will admit you currently, at least as of yesterday or the day before, I believe there were six people, uh, in, uh, the ICU in various hospitals in Hawaii. Um, and I believe we've had one death, but uh, mm, there was yeah. a study actually out of University of Washington um, not too long ago. They have a really good uh, epidemiology center uh, and they made predictions state by state on uh, coronavirus uh, risks and where we might be seeing things in two to three weeks. And it didn't look very good for Hawaii. Uh, I mean, it was better than most states, but we're, they were talking about us being in similar situation to other states with having, you know, up to 300 people in the ICU. We don't have that many, you know, ICU beds right now, as well as uh, a lot more sick people and, uh, you know, a lot of deaths too. So um, we're on a trajectory right now that resembles Italy's trajectory. Now, now, I don't want to panic. I don't want to panic anyone because though that study was done uh, in uh, University of Washington before we started these self, you know, quarantine, self isolation measures. So that may well uh, affect the, the numbers in the study. And in fact, the governor mm -hmm. uh, Ige has asked them to rerun the numbers based on uh, that scenario where we're social distancing and self quarantining. You know, there's a, there's a sort of a dilemma choice in there somewhere. Uh, where the individual may say, well, I only, I only have a couple of these symptoms, not the others. Maybe I should weather the storm at home and I'll, I'll get some cold medicine and I'll take some aspirin for my fever and I'll see if I can tough it out because I really don't want to go to a hospital. Uh, it, I, might, I might catch it worse at the hospital. Hospitals are overburdened and the like. Uh, why, don't, why don't I just you know, take my chances at home? And I suppose if you're a kapuna, that'd be a deadly choice. The other, the other factor that works, though, is uh, if you go to a hospital now, as opposed to a week from now, uh, there might be more beds now and more ventilators now <laughs> and, and, more, and more healthy staff now. So, it's, you know, the other side of that argument is, is I want to get this over with. Uh, let me take advantage of the health system that exists right now so I don't have to worry about having a spot uh, later on. What are your thoughts on that dilemma? <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting <laughs> argument, <laughs> but, um, but the, the flip side of the coin is if you're going to catch coronavirus, it's more likely at a hospital than anywhere else because that's where the cases yeah. are concentrated. So yeah. I, w I wouldn't advise that. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a case in point. I had a, a borderline fever. My temperature was 100.4, you know, the minimum qualifier. Um, I had aches and pains. Um, I didn't have a, a cough or any chest pain or, you know, trouble breathing, uh, but I was, you know, achy and painy kind of like, you know, symptoms that you headache that you might think, uh, of the coronavirus or it could, or you could think of it as a common flu. I've had my flu shot. Um, and of course I was hiking up the mountain the day before. So I, there's reason to have aches and pains, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I just sure. self, I, I knew I couldn't get the test easily and I didn't want to go out and 
wait in four hours in some of these uh, 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 medical centers that are allowing people. And I knew I wouldn't qualify. <laughs> so I thought, all right, I'll just stay in my room and get uh, room service from the family <laughs> for 14 days. <laughs> so that's pretty, well, you know, pretty much what I, I did. Of course, you have a certain amount of concern if you have any of the symptoms. Um, <clears throat> but I, you know, I just want to visit the issue of uh, testing. You know, it's a, it's kind of, uh, it's a troublesome issue. It's a troublesome situation. And, uh, and uh, you know, it seems to me that if you could test and get an answer back in 15 minutes, a lot of the anxiety would go out of it. You'd know one way or the other what you, what you got. Uh, but we don't have that. And I wonder if you could, uh, you know, yeah. discuss that with me and tell me what we do have and when we might have a 15 minute uh, test possibility. That's a really excellent question. And it, it really reminds me of, uh, of the situation that maybe the path that this country might have gone down had we had the test kits available like they had in South Korea and done a lot of testing. That's the way you understand how much disease there is in the community. You take a large sample, you know, you test healthy people, you test unhealthy people, and then you make some decisions based on that. We didn't have many tests. You know, we had in the beginning, we had to go through the Department of Health um, in Hawaii. If you had a, you know, a case that you thought might be coronavirus, then you send a, you know, a swab sample, nasal swab sample to the Department of Health, and you have to fill out, fill out a form. And if you didn't meet the CDC criteria, then they wouldn't send it to the CDC to get tested. But uh, so, you know, we got really far behind the curve in this country, um, including in Hawaii. And, um, but there, you know, uh, there's places like South Korea, like I said, they tested uh, hundreds of thousands of people and they got a really good, they, they, they tracked down the people uh, in the beginning, what their contacts were and isolated all these people and they didn't have to shut down their economy. You know, the, there wasn't, uh, uh, you know, of course there was social distancing and that kind of thing, but it didn't have the, the same massive effects that it's having in this country because we've, we've had to take all these, these, uh, uh, measures for social distancing and cl closing down restaurants and closing down, you know, pubs and gyms and, you know, any place that people gather. Uh, but, you know, getting to the second part of the question is that, you know, what, uh, what can you do about it and when's there going to be testing? Well, there is actually uh, a couple of tests that uh, have, are in development. Uh, there's a company called Inovio um, that is, also is uh, working really hard on getting testing and uh, and a vaccine available. There's about half a dozen vaccine companies, but the testing, you know, I'll, before I go into that area, the testing is really important and there is some hope. There's a five minute test that Abbott Labs has developed and uh, they're gonna be making it widely available in the next few weeks. So I see over the next, you know, uh, month or two that we may, we may well all be able to get a, a quick test without standing in line for four hours. Um, and there's also a 45 minute test that another uh, company has developed. Um, so there's, that's definitely going to happen and that's going to help a lot with the situation because we'll really get a better idea of what we're dealing with. What about the mask issue, Brad? Um, you know, there's been, it's the, I guess the CDC has changed its mind about that. At first they said, you know, if you didn't have the disease, you didn't need the mask. Um, but, but that's changed. Now they're suggesting everybody should wear a mask. And um, unfortunately, it's hard to find a mask. Uh, and I believe that one of the reasons they were withholding instructions to use a mask before is because they knew it's hard to find a mask. <laughs> but now their advice is changing, maybe because there are more masks, although I don't, I don't know where they are. Can you talk about what to do on masks? Yeah, I, I think that's an, in, it's the CDC and the WHO are still at odds with that. The WHO is saying, oh, you know, don't need to wear a mask. And, you know, it's, it's, it was, uh, you know, reasonable if you're distancing, you know, uh, six feet from each other. And if you're going out exercising and the wind's blowing and, you know, nobody's coughing around you. Yeah, that's okay. Um, but now, yes, the CDC is 
uh, I don't know if they came out with the official announcement. You might be ahead of me on that one, but I know that their they, their expert committee, um, that also the, the the committee that advises the White House, is saying that it 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 sounds like they're they're, they're talking about uh, if they haven't already, then talking about coming out with an official announcement that you should wear a mask if you go outside. Um, and of course, if you got a uh, family members that are sick, you know they need to self be self isolated in a room and and and. And other people, if they go near that room, should be wearing a mask. Um, now they're getting back to the best kind of mask is the N95 mask, which is the kind of mask that you wear for tuberculosis and other highly infectious airborne viruses. And as we mentioned before, there's evidence now that suggests that uh, COVID-19 may well be airborne. Um, so the I think we're probably going to come to this point where, where you. Yeah, everyone, if you go outside, if you go shopping, wear a mask, you know, if, uh, you may be, you may be an asymptomatic carrier and, yeah. and spreading it all over the place. So yeah. a mask might help mitigate that. Now the masks that, uh, again, are, are the best are the N95 and those are the ones that you just can't get because, and even medical professionals, like we're running out of those in the hospitals. When I ran, was working the wards before, you know, we had to test for this N95 mask uh, every uh, every year, make make sure it fit and and that it worked. And I've got one lying around somewhere in my house. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, you know, e even though the you know the 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 CDC uh, uh, is leaning toward, uh, or uh, like I said, is moving in the direction if they haven't already with the mask, that uh, it's not going to fully protect you, obviously. Uh, like an N95, because those particles are really small uh, for COVID-19, but it, it'll help a little bit anyway. It's something they're, they're saying. Even if you can't find a mask, it said they're not. They're saying do not buy the N95 because we need those for the medical professionals. But uh, even uh, a, a homemade mask, where you take uh, a scarf or something like that and just make a mask out of it, will will help a, uh, something. You know, especially if you're you're coughing and that kind of thing. Can we talk about some of the medicines? I mean, this is sort of not yet approved, not yet FDA tested. No, no, no trials for coronavirus have been conducted, and yet there are people who claim that they've been cured or the disease has been um, ameliorated. Daniel Day Kim was a good example. The actor uh, went on made a video about how how uh, these various malaria drugs uh, saved his life. Um, what about that? I mean, is this advisable? Is it is it worth studying? Is it worth doing? Uh, and, and what do you think is going to happen in the future? There also apparently is uh, there there are a number of, of uh, anti immune system uh, drugs that are used for other diseases. In other words, the, the the killing feature in this virus is that it it provokes your immune system into you know over responding, and then you can't breathe. Uh, and if you could stop the over response, then you know you might survive. And there are drugs that stop the over response. I, I don't know how far along they are. They're used for other other diseases. But I wonder uh, what do you think about these non yet approved type medicines that are being bandied around as candidates potentially for either for a cure. I don't, I don't know if there's anything being banded around for a vaccine, but for a cure. What what, what should we consider, if anything? Well, I think that that's a really good question, and the I would say that uh, the most promise there, there's at least uh, half a dozen medications, including the antivirals, uh, like general ones like hydroxychloroquine, that uh, uh, all, otherwise known as Plaquenil, that um, the president has been touting quite a bit, and and his advisor, Dr. Falsi, is sort of saying, "Well, we need you know really need to see randomized controlled trials," but the the problem is, you know, if if you're if you've got a severely ill patient, you know, and and, and you don't have anything else, what do you do? So um, hydroxychloroquine has been shown in you know in uh, clinical use. Now this is sort of uh, more anecdotal, not 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 as evidence based, but uh, in France and in China, China is doing uh, several. Uh, placebo-controlled trials right now, um, or randomized trials, um, with the 
with the medication with, with this hydroxychloroquine and, and in combination with other medications. And they're reporting in their early results, although not yet published, that it's uh, efficacious and it basically cuts down the days you're ill by a substantial uh, number of days and it cuts down your symptoms as well. Now, uh, there's a uh, half a dozen other antiviral medications that uh, one is in, uh, in use in Japan. Japan's running a clinical trial on that, but you know, to get definitive evidence, it's going to take time. And uh, but in emergency situations, doctors might be choosing to use some of these. They have in France and they have in China. Um, so if you've got nothing else, you know, then, then it's uh, you have to make that clinical decision uh, on a risk. Uh, risk reward base yeah i just wonder if you know at that point when you're in, when you're in trouble um is is the patient customarily conscious to make that decision um is it you know doctor says we have some drugs they've been used for you know other other diseases uh would you like to try it um or is the patient you know non-compass and, uh, you know, he doesn't really have any, have the wherewithal to answer that question. How does it work in practice? Well, I think that you nailed it. If, uh, if the patient's conscious, then they can make, uh, and they have the capacity to make that decision, um, then the patient can, in conjunction with their physician, decide what, whether they want to go that route or not. If they're not conscious, then it, it'll fall on to, uh, usually a family member. Uh, most patients these days, especially elderly patients, have, you know, a, a living will or, you know, a, a document that, that states their wishes and who, who is going to be the healthcare proxy, you know, and that proxy, usually in conjunction with, after consulting with other family members, but not necessarily, makes makes that decision. So yeah, there's a way to to get, to get at the answer. Yeah, so and there's you know, no medical... There's no medical practice reason to withhold that drug. In other words, if I say I, I would like uh, hydroxychloroquine, I would like that, um, doctor's going to give it to me. He's not going to say, well, you know, it hasn't been through trials and blah, 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 and it's not really appropriate for it. Because of that, it's not appropriate. I mean, he's going to give it to me if I ask because there's enough evidence out there to suggest it could have a positive effect. Am I right about that? Yeah, I mean, there are some contraindications like with any medications, but it's a, you know, uh, you know, if you're allergic to it or, or uh, um, so, but the, uh, the, the, in terms of medications, uh, you know, it's uh, re reasonably uh, safe. It's not something, let, let's hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine itself is not, not quite as safe, um, but you can have some side effects, but uh if it works, it works. And I don't, you know, the, I don't think most doctors would, would prescribe it unless you were, you were pretty sick. And, mm, yeah. um, but it's, it's something that uh, the CDC is looking at very closely. And, um, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, they may have, uh, 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 allowed it for, uh, compassionate use, you know, if, if it looks like mm -hmm. there's nothing, no, no other choice. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, if, it's, if it's prescribed um, then, then uh, by your doctor, it is an off-label prescription. So it's, it doesn't have a, yeah. it's not uh, approved by uh, the, uh, by the, you know, the federal authorities, uh, FDA, it's not FDA approved for um, treating it, but as an off-label, uh, uh, treatment for, for that's the between the physician and their patient. They make that decision jointly. Yeah, but I'll One tell you in Hawaii. Uh, good luck getting some hydroxychloroquine because I think at the farm <laughs> people there's been a run on it at the pharmacies in Hawaii and all over the country. And I, you know, I think it's oh, going to be really, really difficult to get it. So it, really? uh, I heard that yeah. one of the companies is going to be making a. Uh, a million doses and uh, contributing it to, for free to uh, all over the country. Um, so it may, may become available, but if you call your typical pharmacy and call your doctor and say, well, you know, maybe I can have a little bit of this at home just for safe safety reasons, um, good luck. 
let me know if you find yeah. it. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. That's very important. Uh, <laughs> so let me let me uh, let me go to one last question before we're out of time, and that is about Kupuna specifically. So you you have them in their apartments. Uh, you you know you told them to stay at home, uh, or they're quarantined for some reason, but they're really not on the street. Now it becomes necessary for them to go on the street, or, or at least the question is raised. The question is raised, for example, to go to the doctor's office. The question is raised and on a non-coronavirus issue, some other issue, who knows what, um, or to go shopping, uh, or to get something that they consider essential. Um, what, what's your advice to them about, A, uh, handling a trip like that, going outside like that, what, what should they do? And B, uh, what's your advice when uh, th they want somebody to come into the house, maybe for cleaning, who knows what, uh, some who, someone who's not part of the immediate family? In other words, what's your advice as to engaging with others uh, for a vulnerable, you know, kupuna? Well, um, I think that's an excellent question. And the my advice is to have as little contact with other people as possible. And um, in other words, if you can get someone to do your grocery shopping for you, like a family member, that would be better. Um, there should still be six feet between you. Maybe your family member can drop drop the groceries off at the, the porch. You know, um, I would not uh, at this point in time and until things have calmed down uh, more and we've got this virus under control, um, I would not have regular maid service, uh, cleaning services, that kind of thing. I would do everything I can to, you know, to do it myself. If you, if you insist on it, then I would make sure that they wear a mask and that you wear a mask as well. And anything they touch, you know, they better be clean, <laughs> you know, cleaning with you know, Clorox or another <laughs> compound that can kill coronavirus and then you know if they actually and they should wear gloves but if they and if they touch anything without their gloves or you know even you know have them take their shoes off and leave them outside you know don't take them inside it's uh coronavirus is really tricky and there was a study done um that showed that uh coronavirus uh e even if the 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 protective clothing is uh uh, sort of, uh, how shall I say, uh, shaken around, uh, then you can put uh, coronavirus particles in the air. You know, patients' rooms, there's been coronavirus on the out, you know, that has seeped through the vents uh, in one study. One study in, in China, there was, uh, a long, there was a facility where this uh, kapuna was uh, uh, completely by herself, hadn't gone anywhere, um, and had had very little contact and no sick contacts and they thought well maybe it's getting into the vent the ventilation system and so they studied and there was coronavirus particles in the ventilation system so we're talking about you know there's a lot of stuff we really really don't know you know about the virus and taking as as much precaution as possible is is, is really the way to go wash your hands frequently um I'll, I go outside to exercise, and when I come back, it's like a decontamination zone. You know, all the clothes go into a plastic bag. My shoes are outside. I, I, I spray everything with the, uh, basically isopropyl alcohol mixture, about 70%. Um, then I go straight to the shower, <laughs> and I do that with well, my it's kids. All, it's all very reasonable. Yeah. Well, I think we, we're still yeah. learning, so obviously, it's, uh, and... Uh, yeah, so everybody has to get the message and we all have to be careful just like that. I hope we can visit back with you, yeah. Brad, later because we'll learn more and, and you'll see more and we can compare notes going forward. I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing this with us. Oh, Thanks absolutely. So it was my pleasure, Jay, and I look forward to our next chat. Everyone stay safe. Stay safe. Aloha.